Hey, what's up everyone? It is Sunday night and it's just after nine, which means it's time to wind down your weekend with Bat City Comic Professionals. As always, I'm Shannon, aka Small Press Shan, and I am here to talk to you about all of the awesome titles that came out from indie publishers this week. We're going to run through all of the different titles, then we're going to talk about the place of the week, and we're going to go over a couple of the other things that came out. It's good week for comic books. We're going to jump into it in just a second, but before we do, we are going to try this week's wine, which we are drinking Red Cloak, which I really just absolutely love this uh, label that we've got, and this is, let's spin it a little bit, there you go. Uh, it's a Pinot Noir, and it's from it's from California, and doing a little spin here. Um, and it's I'm like, which direction? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, and it is supposed to have like taste of vanilla and uh, oak and all of the normal things we hear about in a Pinot Noir, but it also says that it has a hint of rose petals in it. So I haven't had a wine that specifically advertised that it had rose petals in it, um, especially not from something that was supposed to be a Pinot Noir, and so I'm really excited. Honestly, when you pour it out, though, it's not super dark. Uh, usually Pinot Noirs, I mean, as the name would imply, are pretty pretty dark in nature, but this looks really, really light, so I'm kind of curious to see um, what it's going to taste like. So we're going to figure that out right now. I really expected that to be sugary based off of how thin it was, but it's actually not as sugary as I thought it was going to be. So that was that's pretty surprising. It doesn't really taste that vanilla -y, though. I guess you can kind of taste the oak just because it's got that like pinot kick to it, but it's not really all that um, it's not really all that vanilla -y, and I'm not really sure that I know what rose petals taste like. Um, so, couldn't tell you if they're in there or not, uh, flavor-wise, but it's pretty good. Um, so I'm going to be drinking that tonight, and, uh, it's going to be delicious. It's whatever you're drinking, uh, whether that's water or soda, or if you are winding down your weekend with us, um, I'd love to hear what you've got going on. I am going to open this up really fast, and I'm going to share this video so everybody knows that we're having fun. And I'm going to get this going. It's going to be awesome. I feel like that was just like a, almost a rough, like Blue's Clues kind of singing along. So you should all sing along with me next time. Um, we're going to talk about some really great comics. Um, I have a lot in my face of the week this week. And I had to like start kicking some of them out. Because I was like, I loved every comic book. They're all amazing. Um, and so I, I really like was like, okay, calm down. Like limit it to four at most. So... We're going to go through the uh, books that came out this week and talk about them as quickly as possible so that I can spend forever on uh, the picks of the week because I'm super stoked about a lot of them. So I'm going to move this red cloak over to the side. Check that out. We're going to talk about some some of our books and then we're going to talk about some cool things that are going on. Actually, I'm going to throw some of those out really fast before so that way if you aren't still here at the end of the show, you don't miss it. Um First and foremost, the new calendar for Oscura's live music is out uh, for the month of April. It's going to include things like the four-year anniversary of the Friendly City Flea. So if you are in Bradenton and you haven't checked out Oscura yet, next month is going to be a really cool one. Um, especially because we have the return of Wolf Face. What? If you haven't seen Wolf Face, they are literally a band that dresses up like Michael J. Fox and Teen Wolf as they play their music. And are they punk music? Do you remember? I think they are. Um, they've got a couple of different opening acts for them. One of them, which is The Losing Game, which uh, we are fans of because it has our one and only TV artworks, Vaughn, in there. What? Subscriber. Yes, he's a subscriber. Um, the, the awesome, amazing uh, Vaughn, aka TV artworks, a part of The Losing Game. If you haven't checked out um, his art in general, you should check it out at TV Artworks on Instagram and all of the social medias. Um, he'll be at Megacon this week coming up, so you can stop by his booth if you're in the Orlando area. But if you're in the Bradenton area, his band will be playing uh, with Wolf Face on uh, February 14th or April 14th. Wow, just decided it was Valentine's Day on <laughs> April 14th. Um, we're getting there. Um, and then the other thing is, of course, we will be at Megacon as well this upcoming Friday. 
Um, we will be hosting a panel at 2 p.m. It's a comic creation workshop. It is for all ages. So bring out the kids, um, bring out yourself, whatever you want to do. It'll be in the family zone because it is all ages content, but we are going to be talking um, about how you take your hero problem and solution and create a story with that to make an excellent comic book. So that's this Friday coming up, uh, March 31st at Megacon in the Family Zone at 2 p.m. You can come find us there, which also means that the store will be closed because Matt and I won't be um, at Megacon hosting that panel. So uh, we don't come this Friday because we won't be here. Um, come to Megacon instead. And then also coming up uh, in the end of April and through the beginning of May is the Ballad of Old Manatee. And this is super cool. It's an interactive experience. Um, like you actually like immerse yourself into the story of Old Manatee and the Lonesome Graves. So um, if you've been to Bat City, you know that we're inside of one of the historic buildings of the original town of Manatee that no longer exists. And it's super cool. We love all the stories of it. And this musical is actually going to put you back into that time period. It takes place at the historic village we're super stoked to go to it, um, and we hope everybody else will too because the money from the tickets for this event actually go to preserve the church uh, that's a, inside of the historic village right now, which uh, was put in the historic village by the people who used to own this building. So uh, please check it out and support local. There's so many local incredible things going on, and as always, when we talk about supporting local, don't forget to support Mysterium Escape Rooms over in Sarasota. We love those guys. We have some awesome, crazy, cool stories of all the fun we have with them, um, and thank you, uh, Nick and April, for always being amazing hosts anytime we pop over there and get to hang out with them. And uh, escape rooms are fun, so you should totally go enjoy them if you're in the Sarasota, Bradenton area. So, all right, we've got comic books. Here we go. Um, up first, we've got Torrance, issue two from Image Comics. This is the story of a woman who is a superhero. And in the very first issue, we see that she's kind of been at this for a long time and she's very at her job. And a new young superhero really wants to come into the scene and kind of get her help with situations and kind of use her as a role model. And uh, she doesn't really want him around that much because he's kind of like really rash and doesn't really make the right decisions and he kind of uses her real name and things like that and she's like this is dangerous you're dangerous please stay away from me at the end of the first issue a lot of very bad things happen for her family and you think it's kind of just going to be a story of of her trying to get them back and get after the people who have hurt them and uh, you're not wrong but it is definitely one of those where we're gonna see a lot of really cool superheroes that are made up for this story universe um, but we are gonna follow this one superhero who may be falling from grace as she has to figure out um, what's more important to her her secret identity her superhero powers or uh, the family that she she has been trying to protect this is such a good a good character already um, I absolutely love the way that she she moves through the pages, but also the way she just makes those decisions. You know, she sits there and she has those rational conversations with herself. And then sometimes she does the exact opposite of what she was trying to convince herself to do because she realizes that's not the best thing for her family. And um, they actually have a very uh, Punisher-esque type logo on the back. And that's a great uh way to compare this to like if you are a fan of somebody who goes on that revenge mission and is like I'm a superhero of revenge and you hurt my family and now I'm gonna hurt you you're basically gonna get that in the story and so we're getting a, a female Punisher here and she is awesome so jump in it's only on issue two so you didn't miss much yet there's still time uh also issue two tower issue two from a wave blue world is out this week we were so excited when issue one of this came out because it was such a fun book and i love it because you wake up in the story as confused as everybody else but we are essentially following a bunch of teens into their early 20s who have been stuck in side of a living breathing video game um and they they have their weapon choosing moments and they have their sidekick choosing moments and they have to kind of align themselves with different people that they come into and our main character just wants to get out of there and doesn't want to hurt anybody and she's not doing a very good job of that and neither is anybody else 
And in this issue, we finally kind of start to see some of the people turn on each other and some of the people that uh, we thought would maybe go a little further, have some problems that we didn't expect to see. But we also find out that there are people behind the scenes who are running this game. And when one of them finds out that a member of their family has been stuck into the game, suddenly all of the rules are out the window and things are changing. And so the tower seems to be not only a crazy, fun, almost uh, running man meets like a game on your Xbox, uh, but it seems like it's going to also have that um, complete like twist on and every issue where something's going to change and you're going to be like, whoa, now this book is completely different, but you've got to see who the last man standing is going to be and hopefully you make it out alive. So issue two, Wave Blue World, a publisher we absolutely love who usually goes from issue ones into trade paperbacks. So I'm glad that we're actually getting to see a full series like come out in single issues from them. Up next from uh, Blood Moon Comics, we got Stray Sheep number two. This is one of those books that when issue one came out, we honestly said that issue one needed a trigger warning. It had a lot of, a lot to deal with depression and violence and personal struggles that were really, really heavy topics. And we kind of didn't know how it was gonna pay off into the story. And so this issue two finally gives us more information about what that is. And so we find out that our main character, Coulson from issue one, who was dealing with all of those struggles is now working at a grocery store. And while he's bringing people up, he gets a USB drive dropped on his counter and it's got an address and a date and a time. And he shows up and he meets these people who are wearing animal masks and they give him a mask and they say, if you're in, put this on and never take it off again once you go inside and simply follow the rules and do what they say. And he gets inside, he sits down at a table and they tell him, you're going to drink this glass. And if you don't drink what's in the glass with it, uh, you're going to like, you're gonna die. And if you do drink what's in the glass, you might get poisoned. And so you might also die. And the only way you know who's drinking and who isn't is you're going to play a dice game. And so there's no way out once, you can, like, once you've made it into the building. And Coulson's kind of like, what else do I have to lose? I'm in. I'm here. I don't want to die. But I also don't care if I do. And so we've got some secret society and some dark things that are going on. The teasers for issue three sound like we're going to get really deep really fast into the mess of this underground world that he stepped into. So if you're looking for a book that's got that secret society, that's got a heavy, heavy, heavy uh, darkness inside of a person, and you're looking for how it might play out for them, this is going to be your mature title that goes into that for sure. Um, and we're only two issues in, so this is a great one to jump in on if, you're, if you've been looking for that. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have uh, Kara, Guardian of the Realms, issue two from Busy 8 Entertainment. Uh, this was one of the books that when it came out, it was 100% in the Pixel Week. And honestly, this is another one of those moments where I was like, let's just put all the books in the picks of the week this week because I want to put Kara in the picks of the week every time it comes out. But if you missed the recap of issue one, um, you got to jump in. This is Vizzy 8, uh, one of two titles from them. That was their first, they, they launched on the same day. It's their first two titles as a new publisher. And this is the story of a young girl who lives in the, a forest realm and her job is to just take care of all of the creatures within that realm. So she goes out and she makes sure that the deer are eating. She may like make sure that the animals aren't fighting with each other, which are like dinosaurs essentially that she's kind of like separating. She makes sure that people are migrating to the different places where they should. And in this issue particularly, her little uh, her little buddy, who is like a mythical cat type creature, decides that it wants her to take her to the the ocean. It wants her to go to the coastline and see uh, what what these other people are doing. And Kara's like, I'm not really supposed to go near the other humans and into that realm, but I could sneak you over there. And so they sneak off uh, through. I'm going to show the guardian. They go through. Um, into where the other guardian is and he is trying to help her uh, understand that she needs to limit the time that she spends with people. We have no idea why, 
but we are seeing that there's something very special about Kara in this issue, and I cannot wait to find out what it is when we get to issue three and she does discover uh, and we see her interact with the humans for the very first time. So this is a beautifully fun story. It's great for all ages and you should definitely buy it and read it with your buddies all, all over. So um, up next we have the other Busy 8 book, Changelings Issue 2 from Busy 8 Media. Um, this is all about a teenage boy who is supposed who is a changeling and if you don't know what a changeling is that's uh in known and more known in mythology as when a fairy separates um takes a fairy child and puts it into the human realm and stills a human child uh who is in a better health and it keeps it there to raise them so basically they get rid of like weakling fairies and they they take a strong human and they raise that human in the fairy world this is essentially what happens in this story um we don't know necessarily that they're from like a fairy realm but they are from a different realm and so uh, a a boy is who has these magical powers and is from this special realm is switched with a, a girl who's human and so she's raised by these dark entities in this other realm and he's here on our realm um, on our earth trying to protect it and now he is working with a group of people that he's been training over the course of his life to help protect the world from the dark things that they are going to bring from the other side and so the other part of the changeling situation is that they can take tiny creatures like salamanders and turn them into giant kaiju and his changeling sister, as they call her, is on her quest to find these totems that are hidden within different changeling monsters that she can turn into um, magical powers for herself and use them to destroy the world. And so he's got a certain amount of time that he has to stop her and to try to get that power away from her before it's too late. And we're starting to see how each of these people are going to develop their quest and how they are going to develop as characters and where this darkness plan is leading us uh, in this issue. Super stoked. This book has been great. Um, if you're fans of those kinds of adventure stories, if you're fans of kaiju monsters, if you like fantasy, any of those kinds of things at all, and you want just a little bit of each of them in a great story, Changeling is definitely one for you. And again, pretty close to... Um, an all ages is more on your teen side than your middle grade and and younger um but you do you could probably give this to fans of even manga and they would probably really enjoy it so i'm going to take a drink of this red cloak pinot noir that i am drinking tonight hmm. that was good <laughs> I'm like you already done over there <laughs> so um so it is it's very light um up next we have blue book issue two from dark horse comics and james tynion this um was really interesting because i wasn't here when issue one came out and i took it with me on my trip and i was like oh man this is super cool i love the story and then i learned some new things about this week so if you haven't dove into blue book yet it is the story of alien encounters and the main story follows a couple as they are on a road trip home and they kind of lose a couple hours of their time as they interact with a ufo and they don't really know what happened they're kind of like they they know what happened i guess but they're also trying to convince themselves they don't as they have to uh put pieces of it together for the authorities, but also like for themselves. Um, and I learned this week that this is actually a real story. There is a massive Wikipedia page on it about this couple who tells this exact story of their time on their way home and everything that is in the story actually is featured in there. Their conversations with the different people from uh, the different government agencies, the conversations between themselves as they try to figure it out, the dreams that she's having. Like, there is a big, big story here. This is one of the big alien encounters that have been kind of perpetuated throughout uh, American folklore and history, um, whichever side you want to lean on on that. Um, and so our first story in this book is always the continuation of their story because it is a very in-depth encounter story that goes on for their whole lives, essentially. But 
We also get a second story in every book, and this one is based on the Green Children, which is also alleged to be a true story. You can also find it on the internet if you are looking to find information, but it is the story of a brother and sister who are randomly found in the field, and they literally had green skin, and nobody knew what was going on, and it's back in, you know, like medieval times, and so they think it's just to deal with their... uh their eating habits and slowly over time as as they stop eating the foods that they originally eat when they show up and start eating more and more human food they eventually lose the the color of green and the the brother doesn't last forever but the sister does and she gets married and lives on and apparently there are considered to be green children all throughout the world now because she did have a family and that line continued, um, and so her lineage is known as the Green Children because they all have this potentially alien or magical or fairy, who knows, blood inside of them. But if you like those, are these weird stories true? Is the truth out there? Do you want to believe? If you do, um, you should be reading Blue Blood. Uh, uh, Blue Book, well, <laughs> I'm losing it today. Uh, Blue Book, which is actually what the book is called that they like wrote all of the encounter information in uh, for the government agencies for all of the stuff when they were researching the aliens back in the day. So uh, yeah, check it out. It's James Tynion, so you know it's great storytelling too. Up next, we have Moriarty Clockwork Empire issue two from Titan Comics. This is a hugely oversized story, as one would only expect from a Sherlock Holmes book. And this is Sherlock and Watson and, you know, his brother, Mycroft, and um, the usual cast of characters when you see a Sherlock Holmes kind of story, taking on the random occurrence of the missing Dr. Jekyll and the mysterious Mr. Hyde that seems to be coming for him. And as they are piecing that together, they start to realize that there is something dark and dastardly being done with a different group of people. There's always like an underground secret society. And in Sherlock Holmes, generally speaking, that underground secret society has something to do with the one and only Moriarty. And as far as we know, in this particular series, Moriarty is supposed to have died. Uh, we got the whole backstory in this issue on how Sherlock and him were in a battle, and even Sherlock said that Moriarty did not make it out. But now Dr. Jekyll is telling us that Moriarty does still exist, and he's out there, and there might be more going on than we know. One thing is, is this is a Sherlock Holmes book, so we're putting together clues, and I do want you to point out, or I want to point out to you, I guess, that Moriarty is an acronym on this book and not actually just the name. So I'm wondering maybe he's not really back and maybe it's a society that's taking on all of his like crazy activities and all of the brain busters and challenges against Sherlock Holmes. I have no idea. We don't know anything about who's actually doing all this stuff yet. We have little bits and pieces. They give us a little cast of characters um, at the bottom to kind of give you who all of these characters are in the literary world, but also particularly in these stories before you start. Um, the other thing that I find really cool is that you get a poster that is right side up, right? Yeah, you get a poster uh, pinup in the middle of every issue, which is kind of a cool thing that we don't see a lot in comic books anymore. Um, and I think it's super cool that it's a Sherlock Holmes book that's giving you a pinup poster. Like, who doesn't want to hang Sherlock posters on their wall? I don't know. All the cool kids are doing it. Um, but yeah, check it out if you haven't already. This is issue two. Great time to jump in. Great time to get into it for all of you Sherlock fans um, of the show, of the movies, of the books, wherever you fall in your Sherlock fandom, you absolutely need to be reading that. Um, all right, we are going to go a little deeper into some series now, and we are going to hit that off with Plush, issue five from Image Comics. This is the story of a man whose fiance he finds out is cheating on him. And when he tells his friend that he's mad about it and he doesn't know what to do, his friend's like, hey, the only thing you can do when you're in that kind of mood is go to a convention. Like, obviously. And the convention he's going to is a furry convention. So he's like, hey, come dress up like a furry with me and get like, lose yourself, get lost for a little bit. 
they go to the convention. The guy's like, I'm not really into this. He tries to run out, hide in the backyard or the background of things. Ends up sneaking out to a back alley and finds a bunch of furries eating people. And he doesn't really know what to do with that. But he ends up getting arrested and the only people to come to his aid are, in fact, the cannibalistic furries. And now, as we've gone through these five issues, he's developed his own relationship with them. And he's kind of at the point where he is willing to do anything he can to keep his furry friends safe. And uh, this book is great. If you've read anything by this team who did plastic and vinyl, you know that they use these absurd concepts to bring about some real life emotions and make you make you weep in the best ways. And uh, plush is another one of those that's just right there in it, um, getting you like your laughs and uh, you're like cheering them on and then your your sad moments too. So if you haven't read it, um, you got, it's there's still time. It, who knows? It'll probably be like eight issues in the end. I feel like we've still got some more to go. So uh, there's still time to get into it. We've got Dahlia in the Dark, issue four from Mad Cave. This is one of those books that I think that we're going to find a lot of people coming back to when it hits trade going, how did I miss this? So if you're one of those people who's missing it, don't don't miss out. It's so good. Um, and there is a Chris Sheehan variants for all of them. And, you know, we love our Chris Sheehan. But this is the story of a guy who's been working for the mob and he's kind of messed it up enough times that they don't really want to give him any more jobs. And he's on that. I'll take one more job and they kind of need an expendable person. So they pair him with their best person for a assignment to carry a package across the country to a different place. Well, lo and behold, the package doesn't contain things. It contains a person, and it is the daughter of the fairy king who is kind of already wanting to destroy all of humanity, and this is just a great excuse for him to actually do it, and we're kind of seeing that there may be a lot of decisions going on in the background that are being made for us and uh, things get pretty dark and things get lost along the way. And now he's kind of having to make a decision on what's the most important thing to him. Uh, it was his child, that's why he's been doing it. I love this panel down on the bottom where he is seeing his child, like he's remembering his child and seeing them. And you actually see like the child get taken from him and the whole thing, like the light escapes from the panels and gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you can just see that his world kind of sunk into darkness then. And you feel that all along the way as he makes his decisions. And this book has been really great for his character development. More than anything, you get like the action is almost secondary. It's like he walks away and action happens and he kind of reflects on it a lot of the time. And then you can see it as a reader, like you get to see the stuff happening. But more than anything, it's kind of just him like, oh, man, I messed up again and thinking about that. So this is it's kind of the concept has fantasy creatures in it and the concept is an action story, but you're really actually following the character a lot more. Um, so you are getting a character-driven story within those worlds. So it's only four issues in. Again, I think you should check it out um, and get those Chris Sheehan variants. Up next, Damn Them All, issue six from Boom Studios. Recently um, expanded Damn Them All. We kind of all thought it was going to end at six issues. Now we're going to get some more, which I uh, definitely know this is like the end of an arc. But we are, we are not anywhere near the end of a story with this for sure. Um, this is all about essentially a female Constantine. It's about a young girl. I mean, I say young girl. She's probably in her 30s. She's probably not that young. Um, she's late 20s, early 30s. She's got an uncle who has always been a, a demonologist, a putting an, a magician essentially, like does magic to put demons back where they go. Very much a Constantine kind of person. Um, and he is murdered and she's kind of trying to figure out not who murdered him, but who actually let all the demons that are out, out because now the world is overrun by demons and all the mobsters are using them for their gain and other people are starting to invest in them. And she ends up getting connected with a woman who 
allegedly dated her uncle and she wants to solve the murder. So the two of them have teamed up and they are kind of on this quest to not only stop the demons, but figure out the murder. And in this issue, we are finally going to learn what happened with the uncle, how he ended up where he is. That is a crazy looking panel, but it's also a giant spoiler. So I'm not going to show you that one. Um, and we kind of just get some more information about everything and moving the story along. And while we think we might have some problems that we're solving, as any good story does, with every problem you solve, three more open up. And this is a definitely a great example of that in storytelling. Uh, the other cool thing this book does is she has her uncle's guidebook. So every time she mentions a new demon or a new uh, related topic to something with the magic that she's supposed to be doing or any of the society stuff that she's working on, you get that actual information graphic from the book. And it's told from the uncle's point of view. So it's not, it's like half educational and half clinically written, but the other, like all throughout of it, it's just kind of the uncle um, also running his mouth about how terrible these creatures are and why he hates them or likes them. Speaking of magic, we have Banish Issue 5 from Image Comics and KLC Press. This is the story of a guy who was the chosen one, essentially. Um, he is very much a Harry Potter kind of character in a 90s comic world. And in this series, we find out that he was trained in magic and he was supposed to defeat these bad guys. And while he thinks that he did... He also has now found himself in the future and the bad guys are masquerading as heroes as a way to kind of steal what they want and do all the things they want. And so he thinks, oh, it's my responsibility to take these guys down. And he's been dealing with that until recently. And in this issue particularly, he kind of has, um, if you do one of those situations where he wakes up and he's in a straight jacket in a psych ward, and they tell him that none of the things are real that he thinks he's been doing, that he was never a magical student, that there is no magic in this world, and it's all in his head. And he is going back and forth between the two worlds, unsure of what's real and what isn't. The only thing he knows for sure is that he needs to find a way to save his wife. And um, that's this beautiful scene like with them, of the two of them kind of sitting there and talking to each other, and he's not even sure if that's real. And so it's a great conversation between them, but it's also a great way to tell the story of what's real and what isn't within this world. So if you haven't read Vanish yet, um, we're obviously getting pretty close to when that first trade paperback would be coming out, um, or at least ending the arc, uh, because this is issue five. But this has been, uh, it's, it's for fans of things like Harry Potter and 90s comics, this is your extreme version of that. Um, but it is Johnny Case and Ryan Stegman. So just like they did with Venom, they're putting all of that emotional connection into their characters, like on the back end. So you're getting the, the conversation around like what you would think if you were one of those characters instead of just the action. Um, and I love the Scotty Young cover, so... Uh, definitely a good one. Uh, we've got War Party Issue 3 from Rampart Press. This is another one of those small presses where I think this might actually be the only book that we have coming out from them right now, um, or at least the only one I can think of off the top of my head. But this is the story of um, a group of people who are here during colonial American times, and they are finding out that all of the terrible things they're doing to try to take over the different um, countries, and I guess it's around the American Revolution because you've got like England and France and all of these people, and all of the stuff that they're doing uh, is getting thwarted by one woman and her group, and they are um, what we call it, what they call in mythology is skinwalkers, and they are essentially people who can transition into animals. And these people are on this group and they are working really hard to stop all of the, the white settlers and the um, people who are trying to destroy their land. And in it, we also find out that one of the people who's actually been really decent and really helpful um, has that spirit power within him too. And so they want to help him awaken that in this issue and kind of give him the strength to fight against his people that have been targeting everybody um, from the inside out. It's been a really fun story. It's almost always um, a little bit like 
because it is a small press book, you don't have a lot of ads in it. So you get a lot of story condensed into each issue. Um, and we've had, this is the third issue, but we also had a, a prequel issue come out, which was really cool to see how the goddess, essentially, that they believe in, uh, Ziani, how she was able to get the powers that she has and how she's able to give them to people. And she's such a cool character. I really, I really like Ziani as a character, and I want to see more of her for sure. But... I'm going to take another drink. We are drinking Red Cloak. It's a Pinot Noir, and it's good, and I want more. Mm. That was good. Again, it is very light. I kind of, again, want to know what rose petals taste like. It kind of has, I guess, a back-end taste of, like, a rose water or something. You can kind of taste that a little bit when you take a big drink. But other than that... I don't really feel like it tastes, I still don't feel like it tastes very vanilla-y. Up next, we have Grimm Issue 9 from Boom Studios and uh, Stephanie Phillips, who I love and lives really close, oh, not too far over in the Tampa, Tampa Bay area, so we're excited that this is kind of like local, locally owned comic right here. But if you have not jumped into Grimm, um, you're going to have to go trade paperback for the first volume for sure. Uh, cause I know those first couple issues are really hard to get, but this is the story of Jessica who is a Grim Reaper. And in the very first issue, Jessica is seen by a human and she panics and she goes back and reports back to her superiors and she's like, oh my gosh, I messed up and my scythe is gone. All of this bad, these bad things are happening. And she finds out that there is something unique about her that no other Reaper has. And that is that she can't remember when she was born, um, only how she died. And that has come into play in a huge way for who she is. And as we've moved through the story, uh, things have gotten really, really bad. Every a death is not really coming to people that it's supposed to anymore. The Reapers aren't able to do their job. Uh, the ultimate Grim Reaper is missing. All kinds of crazy off the wall adventure type stuff has happened, and Jessica is now being held responsible for all of this. And she's got a group of people who are coming with her along the way to kind of solve this problem. And in this particular issue, they enter into one of the gates of hell, and one of the people in Jessica's party is told that he was able to open the gate because of what he did in his life before he died. And that makes him a bad person. And so we get to see that story and the connection point that each of them have uh, to this character, but also to the afterlife and what's going on within it. And um, just the, you, it's a very tragic story uh, of that person and that character. And so good. And I love that those little things are buried along the way in this story. But we also come to the end and we get the introduction of a new character. And I'm not going to tell you who it is. But it's somebody that we um, definitely are going to see a lot from as the story goes in a big way. So check out Grimm if you haven't yet. Again, there's trade paperback for volume one. And there's actually two different covers for it. Um, there's like the Jenny Brisen cover and then there's the regular cover. Uh, which is cool. I love when trades have variants too. Up next we have Immortal Sergeant issue three from, I believe it's Image Comics. Yes. Um, and this is the story of a, of a police officer who is at he's the sarge he's the gruff uh completely terrible human being that is retiring from his detective agent or his police officer duties um he's always been a detective and now the time it has come for him to retire and his son and his daughter-in-law and his grandkids have all come into town to see that his ex-wife and her wife are around to to be there for this retirement as well and of course the dinner the night before goes terribly wrong and the son and the dad end up in a major fight. Then they also end up uh, at a bar together where they try to have a conversation about how the, the dad never really cared about the kid and how he's never been there for him and how he's going to leave because he doesn't think the dad is a good role model for his kids and he doesn't seem to care about his retirement. And the dad's like, hey, I'm going to need you to shut up and not talk about your feelings anymore because I've got a murder mystery to solve that I've never been able to solve this case. And you either come with me or you go home. But I'm not helping you with either of those. And so we finally, 
uh, at the end of issue three, get to see what the premise of this book has been pitched to us as is these two teaming up for a very, very turbulent buddy cop situation of a son and dad who do not have anything in common and who absolutely seem to despise each other trying to solve a mystery before the last day on the job. Um, it's honestly, if you've ever had a problem with your parent, you're going to identify with almost every page of this story because it is that my dad doesn't agree with the things I do. He doesn't like me as a person. He wasn't there for me as a child. Like you're getting all of those emotions and you're getting somebody trying to say all of those things and their parents still not listening to them. So I think a lot of people will find that relationship very similar to one that they may have had. Um, but it is not, they don't hold back any punches either. Like everything that you want, like, to see happen doesn't necessarily happen. It kind of actually happens the way it would work in the real world. And um, the dad is just, a, he's got a long way to go if he's gonna recover from the arc that they're developing for him. So we'll see if he makes it there. Em emo Girl number four is finally back. It's been forever. And I think it's Black Tooth Comics is what it is. Um, I, I'm not, yeah, Black Tooth Comics. Um, this book came out, issues one through three came out of this book very, very sporadically back when we were uh, still in Austin. So this is the first time we've seen an issue come out in the last seven months because this first one we've seen since we've been here. But this is essentially a Buffy the Vampire Slayer kind of story. This is a young girl who's, whose dad taught her how to be a vampire slayer and it's, um, she's, he's supposed to be the one that like the chosen one and do all these things but the dad ends up in prison before the story ever starts because somebody just accused him of murder even though he was killing vampires and so she's always been on her own and now she is in the modern times it actually takes place in 2020 during covid and everything else that was going on um and she's going through a lot of these different events while the story is taking place and they are trying to figure out how to stop this vampire that is hunting them down and she's got a couple of friends who who believe her and a couple of people who don't and a detective who is supposed to be watching her because of her dad's case and making sure that she doesn't lead them to any other clues she's kind of starting to see that maybe vampires are a real thing and we should all be nervous about them so if you're looking for just one of those fun buffy style stories that um, is in our time period, but also kind of feels like the 90s because of how they dress and the things that they say. This is um, a great crossover for that for you uh, with Emo Girl. Issue 3 came out November 22nd, 2022. You guys talked about it here okay. on the live stream. So it hasn't been that long. Okay, so it was November 22nd. Yeah. Then the, uh, 1 and 2 were when we were in Austin. Yeah. So it was like a 6 month gap between, mm -hmm. or a 4 month gap between 2 and, two and 3. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I lied. It was not. So issue, so if you can't hear Matt, issue two, or issue three came out November 22nd, uh, 2022. So we, it did come out since we've been here. November 2nd. November 2nd. That's a lot of twos in there. There's a lot of twos. <laughs> it's been four or five months. It's been four or five months. Yeah. Okay. So it's a quarterly book, basically, yeah. is where we're going with that. Um, up next is Cheap Tricks, number four, from Bad Kids Press. This is another fantastic story from Bad Kids Press. We talk about how we always love the Bad Kids titles. This is no exception. This is about a, a, a guy and his grandma in the Old West, and they have been on these crazy adventures where they kind of go to towns, and they scam the towns by him acting like he's a big shot like gunslinger. And really, it's the grandma. And so he's like, I can kill you without ever lifting my gun fingers. And the grandma is sharpshooting from a distance. And they've been scamming people out of money all along. Well, in this issue, they uh, end up in a town. And he, I was hoping I could find the picture. Let me see. They end up in a town where she enters him into a boxing match with... I'm not going to find it. Okay, she enters him into a boxing match against... There it is a kangaroo and so he uh he thinks he signed her up but she signed him up and now he has to fight against this kangaroo for money he loses terribly but the grandma steps in to fight some bigger badder people um at the same time we have his father who is hunting them down 
and has found a woman that they left in their wake as well as the sheriff that they left in their wake and is bringing them along for the ride to help find the missing son and grandma and stop them from what they're doing it's honestly it's just hilarious there's it's not there's nothing serious in the book at all it's just a good time it's tons of fun you're gonna laugh out loud so if you're looking for a good comedy that takes place in the old west look no further cheap tricks is great um and we're four issues in to a great story so get in there and kind of binge those four because you're gonna laugh the whole way through going in between those two concepts not so dark but not so uh not as funny but kind of in your zombie land kind of since we've got zombie side issue three from source point press and i think zombie land is probably the closest of the and shauna the dead um are definitely the zombie directions that you're going in this um you've got all your characters like your doomsday prepper you've got a waitress at a restaurant uh, you've got a baseball player. You've got a woman who works at the like AAPI History Museum and Col History and Cultures Museum, um, and the homeless man who usually is outside of that. Um, all coming together, and they are currently on their way to actually get to the Doomsday Preppers' uh, secret layer that he's created to keep them safe. He's got a bunker, but before they go there, he says he has to stop by his house to pick up a friend. Um, and so they are working their way through the city right now. One of the things I love is flashbacks of the characters are told in black and white, but whether we're in color or black and white, all of the zombies are always red. So you know, kind of like a target, the way video games do, you kind of put a target on them. Um, so you can see who what's happening and kind of keep up with it without having to know, like, did that person get bit? Did something happen? Like you get coloring on there to kind of help with that. And in this issue, we are, on our way through through the city to we make it to his uh his apartment the doomsday preppers apartment and uh we find out who his friend is and what may have happened to them and they all have to work together to try to save this friend and i love um the part that i just showed leads into this and it actually says at the very beginning of the whole thing like okay here it is the moment where they have to go through the crazy apartment building that's overrun by zombies like put on your loud metal music and get ready for the fact that like this is your montage of of zombie of zombie side and so they actually use like the zombie side term like in it because they all know that they have to like start fighting but this is it's all supposed to be uh as the title implies day one of the zombie apocalypse and I love all of these characters. They're ridiculous stereotypes of zombie apocalypse uh, movies. And they all work so well together. And you just laugh the whole time. But you get to see people fighting zombies. So if you need a light, lighter zombie story, there it is. Earth Divers Kill Columbus, issue 6, uh, from IDW's original line. This is the story of a group of people who decide that America has been destroyed it's kind of post-apocalyptic at this point and the only way to fix it is to go back in time to when Christopher Columbus first discovered it because they have pinpointed that as the worst thing that happened uh, to America from day one when when it was named as such and so they go they send one person back through this cave and he's a linguist and so they're like oh you can speak the language and you can fight against Columbus while you're there and so he has spent all of the last six issues trying to get close enough to Columbus to kill him and failing at every turn because he's constantly making the wrong decision um, or slipping up in some way. And in this issue, we find out that maybe killing Columbus isn't actually going to change things because there's always going to be a fallout of those things and the butterfly effect um, does I don't want to show that, but it's such a cool page. Uh, the butterfly effect is always a, a dangerous, dangerous thing in uh, time travel books. And we're going to see just exactly uh, how that plays out when we go through the rest of these stories. Uh, because things things definitely change really fast in this book as we get to the, the climax in this issue. So... I'm stoked to see where it goes because I've been wondering if we were going to be like, and that's how you save the day. And then now we get to this point and it's like, okay, maybe that's how you mess up the day. So um, here we go. I'm going to drink some more Red Cloak.
I love that shot of me like chugging that line. <laughs> it's like such a like messy thing. I was just trying to get to the point where I could pour some more so I wasn't like not, I didn't have any next time around. Um, all right, so there you go. Got that. Do you want some more, sir? I'm going to hand Thank that you. off to Matt. Absolutely. And while you're doing that, um, I'm going to talk about some more books because there's still so many books to go. It was such a huge week, week for indie books. I had so many people say, oh, there's not a lot out this week, right? Because there wasn't like a huge selection from Marvel and DC. And I'm like, I don't know. My box is so full. It seems like there's a huge week for me. Um, and so I started talking about all the indie books from people. And they were like, oh, my God, it's a great week. And like loading up their comics. So uh, if you are not reading indie comics, you're missing out. They're so fantastic, and there's so many things. You can find a subject of any kind in independent comics, so make sure you grab some each week at your little comic shop. Ask for recommendations, or watch the show and see what we talk about and find something for you. Um, up next, we have Door to Door, Night by Night, Issue 4 from Vault Comics. This is the story of a group of people who are actually just trying to possibly scam people in a completely different way. They are working as door-to-door -door salesmen for uh, photos uh, of your volunteer fire department. And they are selling these, these donations, essentially, to the volunteer fire department from in every single town. They've never once talked to a volunteer fire department. And while they are doing that in issue one, we find out that they pick up somebody on the side of the street and we find out that there are monsters in this world. And kinds of like ghouls and wraiths and chupacabras and wherever you are, there's some kind of monster there. And they kind of start having to be the people who fight against these monsters because now they're the only ones who can see them. And each of them has a different role that they play within the group on a normal basis. And so that kind of starts to come into play with how they fight these different creatures. Um, in this particular issue, in the town that they're in, they talk about a wraith that's been haunting the town and killing off people and doing dangerous things to them. And we find out in this, you know, as the story goes, I'm not even going to show you the rest because I don't want to spoil it. We find out, like, where the wraith comes from. And as always, that humans are oftentimes way more terrifying than any of the ghosts and monsters that we could experience. Um, this feels like issue four. Feels like it's actually just opened up an entirely bigger universe for us. So if you are reading Door, door to Door Night by Night, um, it's not going to be wrapping up. It looks like within the next couple issues, it looks like we're going to be going um, at the very least four more, if not another um, all the way up to 12 or something, because this definitely just showed us that there's more out there than we were prepared for. So um, grab it, get into it, and kind of figure out like what's going on, because you never know what it's going to be in the next issue. We've got Firstborns issue four from Sumerian. Now talk about things you never know what's going to be in the next issue. Um, this is from the team that brought you Heavy Metal Drummer and um, we've got the Purple Oblivion, things like that. So you know it's pretty crazy whatever's going to be inside this book. And this one to me, it's kind of um, a very weird off the wall version of Stand By Me because we've got the kids who find a dead body in the woods and they're like, oh, we have to go and figure out what's going on. And they go out in the woods and there's this weird alien spaceship type thing filled with all this goo that they get sucked into. And now the uh, nerdy kids in the school are working with these aliens, possibly. And the bullies who are trying to figure out if they killed a kid or not and are trying to figure out how to cover it up before they go to jail um, also find themselves going back into the woods constantly and trying to figure out what it is that they may have gotten themselves into and where all of this is going down. Um, very strange, like, storytelling uh, It's all in all the books, and it's always great. And the art really tells the story, especially in this book, where uh, they lean very heavily on these cool dynamic images. But uh, it is called Firstborns, and so part of me wonders, like, could this be like the prequel to the entire universe that brings all these alien creatures that we see in Firstborns and Heavy Metal Drummer and the, the Purple Oblivion. Like, could this be the prequel story that leads to that all connecting? It kind of feels like it could. 
We're going to find out as these books continue to go on, though. And no, you don't have to have read either of those other two titles to read this. They're all standalone things that may or may not connect. I'm just speculating on whether or not there's going to be a connecting universe between them. Um, that's one of the things we like to talk about at the counter on Wednesdays with all the people who read these stories is, like, maybe there is a connecting piece. We'll see. Um, can't wait to find out. We, we have had, I think, like two Cullen Bunn books already this week. Uh, here's another one uh, with Nightwalkers from Source Point Press. I know there's no um, title. I always end up picking like the, the full art cover instead of the, the one with the trade dress when I grab these to read so that people can, it's so that this isn't the one on the wall. And then I forget to switch it out when I come here. So sorry, everybody, but this is called Nightwalkers. And this is issue three uh, from Source Point Press. So... Don't, don't be confused by my full art cover, even though it's cool. Um, also, if you didn't know, that's what they're trying. We're, there's a whole movement to actually change the, the phrase virgin variant to full art variant. So if you haven't heard that before, that's actually like something that the industry is trying to move towards. So I know Boom has gotten really good at referencing uh, trade dress list covers as full art variants, but you're going to see that a lot more from different uh, comic creators and comic publishers uh, and probably... A lot of local comic shops as well so if you um, are in the industry and you're a collector get ready for a possible complete shift to the term full art variant uh, or full art cover when referencing uh, trade dress list covers that said I'm gonna dive into this book this is the story of a bunch of people who were living ah, 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 um, a bunch of people who were in a rehab center and one night, all of the orderlies just completely disappear, and everybody wakes up the next morning, and there's nobody around, and they're like, where did everybody go? And initially, they're like, hey, we should stay here. And then this creature starts lurking around, and they're like, ooh, we gotta go. Like, there's this monster here. And they end up going into town and finding out that the whole town has been overrun over by these I am legend looking vampire zombie type things. Um, I'm definitely leaning on the vampire side, uh, just as you. Um, but, you know, they could just be ghoulish creatures. And so um, their group has vastly dwindled. Uh, every issue, we see a lot of people going down. This is um, a very tragic, like, <laughs> apocalyptic scene. Um, and our main character is trying very hard to lead them all to safety, and it's not really working. They end up taking shelter in this church, and um, it doesn't pan out well for anybody involved. But in this issue, we also, for the first time, get to see that there's a backstory to this, and the humans that may have been involved in leading us to the problem that we're in are exposed at the very beginning of the story, and so we get to see a little bit of that information. But we also get to see uh, how this spreads and how dangerous and quickly you can change. So this is like I Am Legend meets uh, 28 Days Later. Like, because this is some fast-moving uh, creatures who you can become in any second. So seriously, like, that's a, a great one to pick up if you're if you're looking for something off, like, off that realm. Um up next, Nature's Labyrinth, issue four from Mad Cave. This book, it's been a little bit of a delay for this issue four, and I'm so glad that it's finally here because issue four is so good, and I love this series so much. I think issue one might have been a pick of the week um, or one of those that we were like, it should have been a pick of the week. Why didn't we do that? But this is the story of a bunch of people who've been stuck inside of a, a game. And the game is all inside of a labyrinth. Each one of them was given an identity that wasn't their real name. And they have been told you can team up if you want to, but if you, whoever makes it out gets $1 billion and the chance to clear their name and live a new life. And we've seen some different team ups throughout the time, but we are kind of mostly following one woman who does not want even us as readers to know who she is, but we know that she's hiding who she is from everybody, including the people in charge and maybe like some undercover agent. But this is one of those where like Hunger Games kind of situations where you're like, oh man, I don't know what's dang more dangerous, the, the obstacles that they put in front of us or the people that are in here with us because everybody wants to get out alive 
they want to get that um, special prize at the end. Um, and you just get some really crazy hijinks within this from people who are absolutely trying to destroy each other. And there's still some kind of secret information. And yet there was like a new secret revealed at the end of this one where it was, we find out that uh, a little bit more about the operation of everything. So I love this book. If you haven't picked it up, check it out. I also just love the detail work on even the back covers. Like the line art on this is so, ex like, so incredibly detailed. Like there's, it's ex extensive. Oh my gosh extensive detail on it and you can even see it always fades even to the back cover um with these maze designs and i i want like there's so many pages that i'm like let's have like cool prints of it because there's just so much detail on all of them uh, up next we've got kung fu legume issue five from keen spot and this is the final issue of at least this volume of kung fu legume there is a tease that we might get some more um, of our cute little bean in the future, but this is definitely the end of this current story. If you've not read Kung Fu Legume, it is absurd, um, to say the least, but it is the story of a bean who, a can of beans falls from space and a bean gets radioactive superpower kind of moment and lands next to a little girl who is a genius and her grandfather who she has to create a robot android body for. Um, and the three of them have been on this adventure to stop a lizard king who has been trying to destroy them and the world. And this is their moment of you have to learn to work together in order to defeat your enemies sometimes. And that fighting amongst yourselves won't ever help you accomplish anything. And thinking that you're better than the other person and that you're the only one who can win a battle will also never help anybody. And so until we learn to put our differences aside and work together against the greater evil, we will never win the battle. Um, but you're doing it all in the most hilarious way possible, and it's so much fun. So um, if you're looking to laugh but also have a fun adventure, that's going to be right there for you. And sure readers? Um, no, this one doesn't, I don't think it has any foul language, but I know Keen Spot has like the, the, like sometimes they look like they're for young people, but they're not. This one, um, it is actually like the little girl is kind of the main character and the bean. And so it's more like toilet humor than adult humor on a lot of it. So, um, and the, the lessons are like really like on the nose kind of like, we're going to tell you what you need to know. Like she's even tries to tell the story of like the, the brother getting told he needs to break a stick and each of the brothers breaking their sticks and being fine. And then like the dad saying like, okay, now here's a bundle of sticks, like work to like each of you to break them. And they're like, stop listening to her already and are already fighting in the background. So it's, it's like your classic, um, all ages kind of story, I think. And they usually are pretty good. They did not mark this one. But yeah, I I think you're pretty pretty safe. Like I think the worst is that they call each other morons and stuff like that um, in this one. So um, yeah, but always with uh, any parent who's ever picking that up and thinking about sharing it with their kid when it's Keen Spot book, I always recommend that you check because uh, where your level of joking is, um, you know, sometimes it's like that Shrek the jokes are really more for the adults, but the kids don't get them. And sometimes it's like, no, they're just adult jokes. And you need to actually check that. So um, that's a good good note for Kane's Spot all the time. It's like The Simpsons. They're adult cartoon a lot of the time. Um, up next, we've got Inferno Girl Red Part 3 from Image Comics and your massive verse uh, world. This is the end of the arc, so I was really curious how they were going to wrap it all up, but it actually turns out that we are just opening it up. And so in this story, we have a young girl who is going to a boarding school. Seems like she's in high school, not college, but kind of in that boarding school, college kind of situation. And she knows that her mom used to work with Inferno Girl Red, the original one. And so the mom kind of hasn't been able to do anything since then because nobody believed that inferno girl red was real and that that superheroes exist in this world and they kind of thought like the mom was a, a journalist so it's like if nobody believed lois lane that superman existed and so the mom has been 
ousted from the journalism world and hasn't been able to get a job. And so she sends her daughter to this nice school and bad guys attack. And it just so happens that her daughter is the new Inferno Girl Red. And now she has to fight these bad guys. And she has no desire to do that because in her mind, Infer Inferno Girl Red kind of ruined her childhood and ruined her mom's life and ruined everything connecting to it. So she's been really bitter towards the concept of Inferno Girl Red and superheroes in general, and now she is one. And this is her dealing with all of that and her connecting with the different people in her life. And um, in this issue particularly, she her roommate is kind of helping her figure it all out um, and how she can turn it into something for herself and it doesn't have to necessarily be what her mom wants it to be or what she wants it to be. Um, but she's also at the same time trying to save her mom. And I'm not going to show you anything from the back half of the book. Because since this is the end of the arc, all of the spoilers are there. So she's trying to save her mom. She's learning who she is. She's working with her roommate. And we um, get some other information that's big for this universe. Um, I get asked the question every week, so I say it every week on the live stream. If you see a book that is labeled Massive Verse, you do not have to read everything from the Massive Verse. You can never read anything else in it. So if you don't want to read Radiant Black or Rogue Sun or Radiant Pink or any of the, no one even, uh, you don't have to. If you just want to read Inferno Girl Red, you can just read this three-part series and you could move on with your life. Um, I recommend that you read all of them. Um, I think that there's some really cool things happening in the Massive Verse world, but they do not connect in any capacity other than in the super massive crossovers during the summer. Um, this has become a crazy thing that we are seeing blow up all over the place with these different titles. And I love how big this universe is getting, but I do love that it can be compartmentalized. So check it out. Inferno Girl Red it's wrapped up in three issues. So you can grab all three and binge read it right now. All right, number ones. Whoop, 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 whoop. It's time for some new books. And we're going to kick it off with something that is always a favorite of mine, which is a Archie Horror one shot. And this is Pop's Chocolate Shop of Horrors. Uh, the Burgers Are to Die For is the tagline. And now I just want a cheeseburger. Um, especially from Pops. Where is my pop-up Pops shop? Okay, we're, we're going to stop for a second and talk about that because there are all of these, like, TV restaurants and movie restaurants and comic thing themed things that are coming out, and we're seeing all these pop-ups all around the world. Where is my temporary pop-up for Pops Chocolate Shop? Just saying, we need Final it. season of Riverdale. Final season of Riverdale, they should totally bring it out. Let's let's make it happen. Whenever that is, bring me a pop shop to shop. I want to go. Um, and then tour it around the country like you did the Safeway, the Bell one, and all the other ones because I want to go. Um, this is it's your Archie Horror. And this is one of the ones that's a little bit darker. Nowhere near the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina uh, Dark, but more in the Betty the Final Girl. And it starts with... Oh my God, that's so terrifying. Uh, it starts with two... People who are on a date at Pop Chocolate Shop and uh, they realize that neither one of them brought money because they thought the other one was going to pay for the date. So side note, always take money because you never know where you're, who's gonna, when that's going to happen. And so they think that maybe they'll just escape from, you know, like Dine and Dash and like Pop won't notice. But he does and he sentences them to work for him. And it's not pleasant. And while that's happening, we get some more stories that are interjecting through that. Um, usually with the Archie one-shots, we get a story and then we move to another story and they don't connect. But this one kind of connects a little bit more. Um, and so we get a break from that story and we go into a story of Kevin Keller working at Pops and having the late shift and seeing some of the weird stuff that happens. Seriously, that girl's face in the napkin thing is terrifying. Um... But we see Kevin's experience working there and how once you work for Pop, you can't stop um, or something bad will happen to you. And then it goes back to our, our main characters and kind of shows their experience of where they're at with working with Pop and all of the dark things that are happening as their story progresses. And they kind of move a little bit along. And then it goes to another story about another experience um, with working at Pops, uh, and it is, it's Betty, and her actually, it's 
just interrupting a late night shift at Pops and figuring out that some shady things go on there and Pop kind of taking the uh, Betty, you are a monster hunter, we need to take you out kind of situation on this. Um, and then, like I said, we just kind of keep going back. And I love that every time they're like, they're like, <laughs> they have this whole scene in there where they're like, but Pop, we just, we were going to come back and pay you. We just needed to leave. And they were like, you let Jughead leave all the time without paying. And he's like, Jughead and I have a very specific relationship worked out. I'm like, no, you are not Jughead. And I want to know, like, is there a special, like, horror thing? Like, are we going to get a, a Jughead at Pops, like, horror, like Jughead the Hunger connected to what he gets his deal with at Pops? Or is it just that Jughead and, and Pops knows that you're never going to not have to feed Jughead, so you might as well just make a deal with him in, in, the, in the immediate moment because he's just going to eat you out of house and home either way. And so really fun. Love it. Again, not as scary as Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Definitely like your buddy, the final girl, uh, the, the current horror movie trope kind of Archie Chilling uh, Adventures kind of stories. Um, up next, we have the return of Exo Man of War. This is issue one from Valiant Comics. And this has been one that has been talked about a lot. A lot of anticipation on this series because not only is it the return of Exo, which has been like only like a year or two, I think. I don't think it's been that long since we've seen Exo in a book. But um, it is Becky Cloonan and Michael Conrad writing with Liam Sharp on art. So a lot of people have been really looking forward to what that creative team was going to be doing with this character. And uh, also, like, the one in, like, 2000 variant was actually a leather cover, um, which I got to hold the actual leather mock-up for it at Comics Pro, and I was just, like, making people smell it because it was so, it was, like, actually real leather, and it's, like, burned into the leather. Super cool. I don't have that. Don't ask me for it. Um, but... We jump back into the world of Exo, um, and we find out that the Man of War himself is kind of gone off into this random space planet where he's trying to keep, you know, he wants to be the defender of Earth, but he knows that people are chasing him. So he's gone off to a planet that he gives its own name. Um, and while he's out in space, he, you know, kind of lures all these people away. And now he's on this planet. He's like, I'll just live here. And they're like, hey, you can't just live here because now people are going to come after you here and there's nobody to protect Earth. So you kind of have to deal with this situation. And at the same time, there is a, a woman who's a seer who is helping them not so much helping them, but it's kind of like forced to help the people who are after him. And she's giving them the information about where he is and warning them that they will not be able to defeat him. And yet, here they come to fight him. And there is a battle to see if he is going to um, cave to their request or is he going to try to uh, defeat them and move on to a war against these people and so great setup for a new series we get to see where the character's been we get to see where the character's going um and you get to learn a little bit of the backstory like kind of put in there in a nice way for exposition if you didn't know exo man of war before you kind of get little bits and pieces thrown in the story um, which I think Becky and Michael have always been really good at doing. Um, and you get some really cool Liam Sharp like spreads. So if you if you like Liam, this is definitely a great way to see his art bring a character uh, to life in a new way. So we also so we're just gonna we're gonna live in like that nineties, eighties, nineties world for a second because Jim Starlin has a new book out this week. Um, this is Order and is it Outrage, yeah, Order and Outrage number one from Dark Horse Comics. And uh, this is Jim Starlin and Rags Morales. So this is a team that you've been hearing about for years, or people you've been hearing about for years coming together to make um, essentially a, a new a new superhero kind of story. It also has glossy cover, and so I feel really bad touching it. Um, but this is the story, oh my gosh, it's so cool, um, of a woman who is on this planet and they are like, hey, where did you come from? We need to know your name. You can't be here. And she's like, I'm not going to give you any of that information. Like, where, who are you? Where am I? You can't know my name. You can't battle me. And so, of course, 
we get that kind of like set up that something bad is going on. And then we flash back to the past um, immediately and we see the story of a, a world where order has come in and like he's literally like Lord Order. And he's come in and it's kind of mythical creature looking people and they have uh, established the order in this world and they come for everybody. And we start following this little girl who is like, my mom was trying to save me. I had some, you know, I wasn't supposed to be born, but I was. And now they came for us. They came for everybody. And we had to run. And while we were running away, I lost, you know, I lost some things along the way. And now here we are in the future and the future is completely and totally destroyed. There's this whole new regime running everything. She's got a fight against it. Um, and I can't show you the second half of the book because she's in bed with this dude and there's some body parts that I can't show on Facebook. Um, but so we're seeing a, a woman basically um, who may be the young girl, kind of like gives us a segue that maybe this is the young girl um, trying to fight back. And maybe she's the same person from the very beginning who is out here to destroy order. We're going to find out. But this is um, definitely the makings of a revolution come into play. So for those of you who are uh, fans of Rags Morales' Rags art or uh, Jim Starlin's storytelling, this is definitely one that you're going to want to pick up for sure. Um, I know we've seen a couple of Jim Starlin stories in the last, like, like one shots come out um, in the last couple years. So this is the first one I've seen that's like an ongoing. So oh, next up, we have The Curse of Cleaver County, issue one from Source Point Press. Uh, for all of you good boy fans, this is written by Garrett Gunn, who is your good boy writer. So this is going to be uh, one you're going to want to pick up so you can continue in what Garrett's like fantasy world. No connection to Good Boy, just that same kind of style of writing. Um, and we had a we had a one shot that kind of gave us a little bit of information about what Cle uh, Cleaver County was. And Cleaver County is a place in the world that is just completely haunted by all kinds of demons and monsters and crazy things. And so in this book, we are going to open up to the first story, which is the first part of the story, I guess I should say. Um, which is about a man who is terrible uh, and he mistreats his secretary like there's a point where he's like can you make me coffee and she's like I'm actually allergic to coffee so I'm not allowed to touch it and he was like oh my god like what's the point of hiring you as a secretary and she's like well a secretary's job isn't to make coffee so um, I don't really know but we find out that he is into some shady things and they lead him to uh, some monsters and some creatures and some bad stuff and as we're kind of dealing with all of that, on the flip side, we go to a bunch of kids who are on a spring break style trip. And of course, you've got your classic teenagers. You've got the one who's like, oh, I'm the wild girl. Like you can see her like flashing the, the truck. You've got the, the boyfriend who's like, okay, like, yeah, let's be, let's have fun, babe. And then you've got the other boyfriend who's like, hey, you don't seem like you're having fun to the girl who, they're like, hey, you're bankrolling this whole thing. You're our straight edge. You're our good one. And so we're kind of setting up our Sydney Prescott kind of girl. Um, and as they do that, they are going out to this adventure where they're going to be going to her home and meeting her parents. And, of course, the mom loves the boyfriend. The dad hates the boyfriend. It's going to be one of those trying spring break kind of situations. And then our two stories come together and we get a setup for an actual um, tale that is going to take us into classic horror. If you read the one shot, you know that both um, both of the issues that were within there kind of set up different points for the Curse of Cleaver County. One was Garrett Gunn's story that is very much an I Know What You Did Last Summer a scream kind of homage literally he even said like yes it was his one shot was all I know what you did last summer so he is setting up your classic slasher homage story um, and then we're going to get a little bit more that's going to come into play through C Cleaver County as we go on so if you are a fan of of those if you're currently picking up the harrower from boom and you're like man I want to keep living in this uh 90s slasher revival that's going on curse of cleaver county is definitely going to give you that and it's you're going to get all that humor that you get from good boy mixed into it 
Um, so grab that. We've got Pop Scars issue one from Sumerian up next. This is, it starts with a girl who's like, today's the day I kill my dad. Um, I'm going to take him out. And we don't really know who her dad is. We don't know who she is. She's wearing this mask. She's walking down the street. And then it flashes to a completely different set of characters. And it is a movie producer who is putting out a movie called Swamp Shark. And it's kind of very much like, uh, obviously like a Jaws kind of reference, but um, it's a movie producer who is like, I'm making this movie. I, and he is working with a new film company and a record company because they're going to put the a major um, pop star into this movie. And she's like, oh my god, I'm so excited to be in this movie. Like, this is going to be so great. And this record company and this production company have out ousted the man who was the original producer of this, this shark movie, Swamp Shark. And now he is very angry and doesn't want to let the guy get the success that he is going to get because he feels like it's his success. So he is determined to go after him and kill him. While he is on his way to do that, he crosses paths with a young girl who says, I'm gonna, I'm here to kill my dad. And they end up forming a coalition of people who are very angry and want to take down the new producer of Swamp Shark. Uh, it sounds super cheesy, but somehow they make it a very, like, great, like, mobster team-up kind of movie all in there. So this is a great blend. This is, honestly, this is one of those books that, when you talk about what a publishing company puts out and one of those books that's just char characteristically uh, a feature of that publishing company, this is one of those, this hits all of the Sumerian pinpoints. Like, you get the bright art. You get the weird eccentric characters. You get your classic almost like mobster killing story. You get your team ups. You get your like Hollywood references, like everything. And then like the emotional story of all of the, I don't know how I feel about this person or my family. You're kind of getting a little bit of all of the Sumerian books rolled into one with this one. I know there's a lot of buzz around it already, so if you didn't pick it up, make sure you grab it because I think this is going to be another one of those books where we get to issue three and people go, oh my god, I've heard so many great things about Pop Scars. Uh, do you have issue one? And they're going to be gone by then. So I recommend going out and grabbing an issue one and checking it out now because um, who knows how long you'll have. Up next, we have Dead Romans, issue one from Image. And this is on the Shadowline imprint, which we've been seeing a lot of books coming out from recently, especially with The Last Barbarians. But this is this is for fans of uh, 300 or the King Arthur movie that had Kira Knightley in it. Um, I know that's like a crazy, like two, two things that you probably wouldn't know, but there's a lot of people who really liked that King Arthur movie. I don't remember it. You don't remember that King? It was, uh, Clive Owens when he was a big thing. Um, he was in a bunch of movies at a time, but around that same time, actually. And when Keira Knightley had, like, it was like maybe right before or right during Pirates. I think it might've been right before Pirates. Um, but Keira Knightley plays Guinevere in that, and it kind of deals with, the uh, the concept of the Romans in uh, the, the the Britannia, like when the Romans tried to spread all the way into England and they got to a certain point and then like Merlin and the Celtic people were on the other side of the wall and they were really nervous about that and they had to go save, in that movie they had to go save a, a family that was a, a Roman family on the other side of the wall and so they had to go through all of the Celtic part of Britannia. Um, I think we own it. If you need, if you need to know, if you need to know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, but this kind of blends that with 300 because it is a, it's a Roman story uh, and kind of features that Roman mythology a little bit in there. And so this is a story, like I said, much like that where we have a guy uh, who is in love with a woman, and there's a whole scene where he's like. I love you. You're going to be my queen someday. And she's like, I'm a slave. And he's like, well, people need to learn that you're my queen. And you get their whole little, is, can I show it? Okay, yeah. You get their whole moment of their relationship and this instant building of the, the story for us. Like, we understand their entire connection by the end of, like, this one page. And then he goes off to fight where he's supposed to fight. 
And the whole place where she is is destroyed because the entire Roman Empire was just constantly fights and battles. And so the rest of the story is him getting that information of this place was, this camp was destroyed. It seems like nobody made it out. And him trying to get back to that place to kind of figure out if she's still alive and kind of fighting through that um, situation. And so you see a lot of Romans die. You see a lot of uh, the classic Roman Empire stories um, coming into play here. So if you are a fan of not the mythology of ancient Rome, but the, I'm going to make up a word and say warology of it, and uh, more of that, like following the Roman SPQR and the soldiers, the legionnaires, and maybe something could be going on with his girlfriend. We don't really know, um, but we're going to see all of those kinds of things. Um, I guess if you liked the show Spartacus, but you want it to be redrawn with Liam Sharp-esque style art, uh, this is this is the perfect book for you. Uh, because this is, I have to fight whatever battle I have to to get back to, um, to the person that I love in that time period. So, um, and if you did like the show Spartacus, um, I'm sorry for all of the tears that you cried um, during the actual death of the actor who starred in that show, who was wonderful. Um, so check out Dead Romans if you like those kinds of stories. Um, it's very, very good for people who do like that. Like if you are a fan of King Arthur or Spartacus, you're going to love it. Um, and speaking of the mythology side of all of that, we have Fallen Issue 1 from Red 5. This is the gods of all the different pantheons have fallen and are now living in modern society. And each one of them has basically created their own gang and are kind of dealing with living on earth in the way that they can. They're like, well, if we can't control mortals through being gods, then we'll control mortals by being godly men who run drugs. And like, that's the, the modern, the modern God is money and money is spent on drugs. So we're going to, to do that. And in the very first couple pages, we see a member of the, one of the pantheons is murdered. And so now we are also having to deal with all of these different groups being the different drug lords and a, a drug war between, uh, Loki and Thor and the the Greek mythology pantheon and uh, every single one that you could put. If you are, if there is a mythology that you're interested in, I think they're all going to show up at some point in this and there is going to be a massive war between all of them. And they all kind of seem to still have a little bit of their power um, and they're kind of putting that into place in different ways, but you're, you're getting your mobster book, but with the different gods. And it's such a fun book already. Uh, I love when Red 5 does mobstery books, like when they did Carriers and we had pigeons who were militant and running New York City. Now we got Fallen Gods running the drugs through the city. And um, I love this uh, picture of Zeus on the back. Like this is what Zeus would look like in this mobster world where he's like, Daddy's home, boys. And he's talking. Oh, no, sorry. It's Odin. That's who it is. Odin is talking and he's talking to Loki and Thor and that's why he's got the eye patch because this is like modern mobster uh, Odin and it's hilarious. Yeah. yeah, and he's daddy. That's why I thought about it. So, yeah. Um, check it out. It's it's a lot of fun. If you're not really into mythology, I don't think it'll be too much. Like, they don't go into all the backstories. Like, I feel like Hunt, Kill, Repeat from Mad Kid goes a little bit more into the mythology side. This is kind of just uh, your drug lord story. Um, up next... Godzilla, Best of King Ghidorah. This is a one-shot from IDW, and it is going to feature about four different stories from um, throughout time of the IDW, for the most part, the IDW um, Godzilla issue. So we have Godzilla in Hell, issue four, Godzilla Oblivion, issue three, Godzilla Kingdom of Monsters, issue eight, and Godzilla The Half-Century War, number five. Um, and so different art styles, different storytelling, all just great stories featuring Ghidorah. Um, one of my things that I love is that issue one, the first issue in here, which is Godzilla. Um, I think it's Godzilla and Hellish War, but either way, the first issue in here is all silent and it's just a battle between Godzilla and, uh, Ghidorah. And it's just a, an other kaiju 
and it's super cool. And then I love this. They put the retailer and center co incentive cover in here for Godzilla and Hell, and it is gorgeous. And now I kind of want to hunt it down because it's just a cool, cool Ghidorah pic picture. And he is uh, definitely one of my favorite kaiju. So I'm super stoked when I got this one. This was a book that I was like, I could not read it and still put it in the picks of the week just because it's it's all about Ghidorah, but I'm trying to show you, yeah, like you get some other like art styles and stuff in here too. So while you get a lot of the ones that look like the typical IDW Godzilla, which is almost on the kid realm, you do get some uh, great Godzilla moments in here that have some of the detailed art that you would expect from people like Matt Frank and things like that. So check it out. If you're a Godzilla fan, you just should have all of these best of, but I also love that um, IDW is, is expanding their best of. So we had best of Ninja Turtles. We're doing the best of Godzilla. We've done um, best of the Transformers and we're about to get the best of my little pony. Um, one of those books that we're going to talk about forever and ever from here on out, I'm sure, is The Neighbors Issue 1 from Boom Studios. And I've told everybody all week long, anytime Boom launches a new horror book, you should just buy it. And this is one of those boom horror books that you're going to wish you just bought. Um, it is not. This is a Fran This is Franny on the cover. Um, it kind of has that Ginny Frizen. It's like Ginny Frizen and Peach Momoko had a baby uh, in the art on this cover. But this is, this is not the cover A. Um, so you have to look for this one. But this is the story of a family who moves to a new neighborhood. And they're kind of trying, they're doing that classic horror movie, we need to get away from the city, get away from all the things that have been going on, and uh, try something else. And so they move out to this little town, and all of the neighbors are kind of weird, eccentric, whatever you want to call them, and all up in their business at the same time. And we also have all of the family dynamic of the, the daughter, the teenage daughter doesn't want to uh, call the third dad, dad, uh, for various reasons that I'm not going to spoil for you. And they don't have a very good relationship. And then they get some uh, crazy stuff, like people starting to show up in the middle of the night and saying, oh, I'm here to help with this thing. And the kid's like, we don't need any help. We're not, we're not looking for that. Also, it's the middle of the night. Like, why are you here? Please go away. And some stuff happens. And now we have a really, really great setup for your classic horror movie uh, situation. This is one of those where the things that don't happen are almost scarier than the things that do because you know that something's coming, but you don't know what it is and when it's coming for you. Um, but the tagline of this is it's underneath us. So and everything is like a tree so something must be growing beneath them that is going to lead to some dark spooky things and I cannot wait to see what they are. We've got Monsters of Metal, My Bloody Valentine. Um, It's supposed to be a one shot, it's from Opus Comics. It's usually a one shot with these but honestly this one leaves a cliffhanger so this may be an issue one of, of what could finally be a full series, maybe, fingers crossed, of um, Monsters of Metal. We've had two one-shots already within this world, um, and this third one kind of needs to just be the start of a series. It's been so great. Like, let's long Halloween this. We had a couple one-shots, and now let's just launch into a series. It'd be great. But this is the story of the Universal Monsters as they... Um, the band My Bloody Valentine? No, that's the no, that's the subtitle. Well, you'll get there. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, this is the story of the Universal Monsters, essentially. Um, you've got the Wolfman. You've got uh, Frankenstein's monster. You've got the Bride of Frankenstein. And you've got a jack-o'-lantern. Like, um, and then you've got uh, Medusa. And they all are in a band that is called Monsters of Metal. And this was actually the, the guy who runs Opus and I were making, he was making jokes about this with us, that it sounds ridiculous that the, vam the va uh, Valentine's special came out in March, but the Halloween special came out in November, so it sounds like we're on track. Um, but this is, they are all at a show and they're given drugs and they have this hallucination of like whatever their heart's desire is and 
Frankenstein's monster for the very first time, uh, sees himself with somebody other than the Bride of Frankenstein, and who has never wanted to be with him throughout the entire like one shots that we've seen. And he sees himself with a creature from the Black Lagoon type character. And he starts dating her, and she basically does the thing where she starts uh, telling him he's better than everybody else in the band, and he should go off on his own, and that the band isn't good, and she needs he needs to pick uh, up the pace and do things the way she wants. So the band starts to fall apart, and they realize maybe there was something else going on here, and that maybe they shouldn't trust this new girl that Frank has been uh, Frank Sands Monster has been dating. And so we also have some major realizations from everybody else in the band. Um, and I love it because if you read uh, the Krampus story, you know Krampus has been trying to get into the band for a long time. Uh, and he's had some big moments with them in the last issue where he kind of cursed them for a hot minute. Um, and now Krampus does continue to show up in this issue. So it's fun to have him uh, hanging out with the group. But fun story. Um, I love it because Opus is the heavy metal publisher. Like they put out all the metal bands in comic form. Like they work with all of them. And then they're making this that is essentially kind of parodying everything that those other bands are like seriously writing. So I love that they've got this parody of their own line of comics essentially. Um, but that it happens with the Universal Monsters is even better. So um, check it out. Again, I think this might lead us to at least a second one that connects to it. But, uh, I mean, come on, Opus, just give us an ongoing, um, or at least a mini series of my, my Monsters of Metal because we love them. So, and our last number one that we're going to talk about in this zone is from Bad Kids Press. It is Katie Black Dragon issue one. This is so great. This is another one of those, like, could easily go uh, into Picks of the Week if if I had not stopped myself at four and stopped and made myself put some back. But this is the story of a planet that has a really big problem with just believing that anybody that lands on their planet is a god because they don't have that kind of technology. And so we open up with these terrible humans, essentially, who go to this planet and make them sacrifice people or make them uh, give all of their money or make them give all their food. And then they just take it and they're like, oh, we're gods. And they call for help from a woman named Katie Black Dragon. And Katie shows up and immediately just destroys this guy and is like, you're not a god. Like, you're a stupid human who doesn't know like you're a terrible man who doesn't deserve to be recognized at all and nonetheless worshipped and then immediately upon that the people are like oh my god katie black dragon you saved us like now you're our god and she's like i'm not a god i'm just a human stop worshiping everybody who lands on your planet and uh it's just it's a hilarious story of People who um, maybe need to take some time and think about what it is that they're seeing versus what is actually happening. And uh, Katie Black Dragon, is a new hero for all of us who just kind of tells everybody exactly what they need to hear, but also stands up and uh, fights for the little guy at the same time in the most hilarious way possible. Uh, this is Raul Torres on this, who I believe is the same person who does uh, Frankenrocker and the Jailbait Punks. If I'm not wrong. And if I am wrong, I'm sorry. But I think Raul um, does that series uh, as well. But super great. Ton of fun. Um, I think that um, I, I think that this is one of those books that you're going to want to pick up. In, because it's just going to be hilarious the whole time. And Katie is going to be one of those heroes that you are like, man, what is Katie up to in this book? It's going to be off the wall. And I cannot wait to see uh, what she does next. And as always, Bad Kids Press never disappoints. There's not a book out from them that I don't love. So grab it and uh, keep going with the greatness that is Bad Kids Press right now. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to get some more to drink. If you don't know, I am winding down your weekend with Red Cloak Pinot Noir. It's pretty good. Um, it's It's supposed to be... Oh, it's got pomegranates. That's a flavor that I miss. Cherries, pomegranates, and toasty vanilla oak mixed with 
aromas of rose petals. So there's not actually rose petal flavoring in it. It's just supposed to smell like roses. I can see that. Okay, that makes way more sense now. It does have a rose petal smell. And it does kind of taste more like pomegranate. So I feel like now that I reread the label, I have way more understanding of what I'm drinking. Again, a very light Pinot Noir, though. Uh, usually, like I said at the beginning, the name implies that it's going to be a dark wine. This is not very dark for a Pinot Noir, but it is still good. Um, it's kind of like almost like you could give this to a rosé fan as a segue into red wines. So, all right, we got some picks of the week. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know where to go first. We're going to start here. Um, We're going to just... Because we've been up and down with funny and, and dark. So let's just go back to dark. Literally with Deep Dark number one from Source Point Press. Um, and the fact that this is, uh, I love this book because I think that it's like Karen Gillan from Doctor Who or Guardians of the Galaxy or a million other things uh, in the art. So I love seeing it like that because I can almost follow along like as if she was cast in this book already. Karen uh, Gillen. Karen Gillen. Oh, that's different. Yeah, Karen Gillen is a comic book writer. Yeah, I was like, Karen oh, Gillen <laughs> is a, is an actress who is on Doctor Who, and uh, also plays Nebula in Guardians of the Galaxy, which you wouldn't know from this picture, but this is exactly what she looks like on uh, Doctor Who or in real life. But and she's also in Jumanji for those who are a fan of that movie. But this is, is child then. No. Jumanji, the new one is about. Oh, there's a new one. Yeah, it came out a while back. We were it, like two years ago, babe. There's already been a sequel. Oh um, God, really? Yeah. Uh, deep dark though is about a woman who learns of a place in a jungle, like in a deep dark spot of a jungle, that some weird stuff happens, and she wants to investigate it. So she decides to fly around the world to the country that it's in and she starts interviewing all of these people and nobody in the town knows anything about it or won't give her information and then she stupidly meets one man who's like I know where that is and I'll take you there and she's like I'll pay you and he's like great I'll take you there and once again a reminder when you go looking for a weird place and everybody's like no it doesn't exist or please don't go there and one strange man on the street tells you he knows where it is don't take up his offer to let him lead you there because it is a very bad horror movie 101 trope. And she does. And so she ends up in this deep, dark wood with this man and she's telling him how nobody else told her anything about it and how she's heard that there's all these totems in the woods and how all this stuff like is supposed to lead to these creatures and uh, weird old stories and monsters and maybe some other mythological things and how she wants to go there and check it out and like once she gets there she's fine she doesn't need to like actually do anything she just needs to see it for herself and then her cell phone starts working stops working and then she ends up lost in the woods on her own and then crazy things start happening and the further she gets into the woods because she can't find her way out the worse things get uh, this book's great, and honestly, this is one of those books where the black and white actually leads um, more into, like, leans into the storytelling in a really good way. Um, I think that coloring would almost diminish the fear and the darkness that you get because you do have, I'm going to put this back up, you do have this weird creature that lives in the woods, and it hides in the darkness of the black and white panels. And you almost can't see it. In the same way that, like, Sea of Sorrows, like, the sharks and monsters underneath the ocean uh, water would hide, this creature kind of fills in the space in the black and white in a really good way and also uh, leads you to be lost in the woods a little bit more because of the, in like, the intricate artwork and the detailed pencil lining of the forest and the way that black and white, like, blurs together. This book that works so well for the story and again you're getting a classic trope but something that you would have thought would have taken the whole series is like the first two-thirds of this book and then the last third of the book which is why i didn't show it sets up a whole bunch more stuff and so what i thought that this book was going to be is not where this book is going to stay and so we kind of set up even more to come in that last part of the book and I'm super excited to see where this goes it's gonna be great and again I 
just it kind of just looks like Karen Gillan and Van Gogh walking around. Uh, if you saw that episode of Doctor Who, except dark and creepy and um, wonderful. So uh, yeah, if you're into horror and you like really detailed line work, this can be great for you. Up next, also from Source Point, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, um, we have Ben Mortara and the Thieves of the Golden Table. And this is also an issue one. This is perfect for fans of Indiana Jones. Um, this is your classic adventure story in that capacity uh, because we do have, gee, am I covering it? We do have a, a professor at a university who works in like the artifacts depart department, but also teaches classes. Um, Get, he's constantly going on these adventures and it opens up with a person coming to him and saying, oh, we have this mysterious artifact that we've found. Like it's this piece of a map and we don't know anything about it. We know there's some people chasing us. We have to figure out what it is. Can you help us solve this mystery? And Ben immediately is like, oh, I know this is, this is the map. This is the map to Solomon's table. This is a thing that people have been looking for. The rest of the map is actually in this museum and you, can, you can't you can see it though because it's in this room. I mean, I've seen it because I may or may not have broken into that room. I mean, I didn't break into the room. I was just kind of lost. So they end up going on a quest to find, to check out the rest of the map and see if this is in fact the actual missing piece of it. And along the way, of course, we find out that there is a wealth of characters who are trying to get there before they do and who want the information that they have. And we kind of meet each one of them along the way. But what I love about it is I honestly don't know who's on whose side. And that's kind of one of my favorite things in these adventure movies is you think you're on the side with the team that you like uh, but you might be on the team of bad guys. Like my bad guys funding this adventure and it might be other good guys or more bad guys that are chasing after us. Like we don't really know who's who, but we have a really great cast of characters already. Um, I, I'm hoping that even after we solve this mystery, I hope this is just the, the first Ben Mortara uh, book and that we get to see him go on other quests because I'm already like I just want to have an Indiana Jones style character that goes on tons of quests forever uh, because we need that in all media at all times and so fun book really into it if you like that um, you're gonna love if you like any of those adventure stories you're gonna love this and I think that you should definitely jump on now um, and Dude, just get in. It's so much fun. It was so much fun. I was like, I just want to talk about like the adventure, but I also don't want to spoil it at the same time because I'm like, oh, we're going on this adventure to find this thing, but I don't want to ruin it on whether or not uh, where we get to in the process. So just everybody read it and then come back and talk to me about it so we can solve like the mystery and find the go on the quest together and we'll just uh, play the Indiana Jones theme song while we while we do it. Uh, I have to take another drink before this next book because I have a lot to say. Okay. Woo. Um, up next, The Atonement Bell, issue three from Red 5 Comics. Pretty sure, I know issue one was in Pixel of the Week. Can't remember if issue two was, but I'm so glad issue three is finally here because this book is so intense. Um... This is the story of a young boy and his mom going to visit his aunt and his cousin. And when they get there, they, um, I'm not going to show that page, it's so fine. Um, when they get there, they are invited to go to church with the aunt. And she's like, you need to go to church. Y'all need Jesus in your life. You need to be part of this. And while they're there, the young boy starts to have these weird visions, both of like his dead dad, but also of like these weird, like, skinned creatures and these monsters and all this weird stuff starts to happen like around him and so he makes friends with not only his cousin but another girl in the church and they start investigating this and it looks like there is some crazy crazy stuff that goes back to the 1600 kind of time period like early american days and a cult that had been in st louis that was related to their church 
And all of this stuff has been happening for hundreds of years, and it looks like maybe our main character, our young boy, has been selected as the next sacrifice to take place during this midnight mass kind of time period for this cult. Um, and how the cult is connected to the rest of the people uh, is crazy. And everybody, they've got like this one deacon who they call on for help and things don't go so well for any of them. But I love it because we're starting to set up a snowstorm. And I just showed that page where they actually made it snow over the whole page, like and voided the panels. And I think that's so cool because they're like, this snowstorm is going to be tragic for everybody. Um, and I don't want to show that either. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but we start to investigate. We learn some things. Uh, we get so much information in this issue. This gives us the backstory of everybody, of how people are connected. And then we start to see who we can and cannot trust really pan out in this issue. Classic horror. So much fun. Um, and it's on, on the edge of your seat the whole time when you're reading it. So this is one of those where you're like, Oh man, what's gonna happen? Oh, who is? Can we trust that person? No, we can't trust that person. Yes, we can't trust that person. No, we can't. Maybe I don't know. Um, and you're constantly like worried for these kids, and then things get darker, and possessions and crazy stuff starts happening. So check out Atonement Bell. We're on issue three. Could be only a four part series. Probably gonna be a five part series. I don't know for sure. Um, I just mostly don't want it to end because it's going so well so far. So check it out. Um, and then lastly, for picks of the week, we, I've already mentioned this once this week, uh, I've mentioned this a thousand times this week if you've been in the store, but this is a Theris, and it is a one-shot, it is from Source Point Press, and everything about this book is beautiful, um, from the cover to, which kind of gives me H. Billion King vibes, um, but from the cover to the story to the way that they use the medium uh, to the art, it's all fantastic. And this is, um, I'm going to try to find a great place. We're going to start right here. This is a story about a girl who has passed away. And she wakes up essentially in her own afterlife. And she is kind of trying to deal with her her demons of what she feels like led to her death but also the things that she did wrong to other people and a little bit of how she, other people may have wronged her but this story what's cool about it is every three pages or so it switches to verse and so we'll have a full panel page that has a poem on it and the poem tells you kind of her thought process while the comic panel pages tell you what is actually happening. So in the storytelling portion of it, we see her kind of moving through the world and experiencing the world. And those verse pages kind of have her dealing with the emotional fallout. And it's so beautifully done. It's one of those books where you cannot read it quickly you need to actually stop like I went back this is probably I probably read this book three times already um, because I wanted to just experience all of it and I promise you I'm gonna read it three more times at least uh, because I want to break apart every single line in the poems like it wasn't until the second time I read it that I discovered that part of her death was because of alcoholism and what she realized that all the things she did wrong to people were because of what she allowed to come out of her alcoholism and there's this part in here where she's like I have to climb this mountain and she talks about how the mountain feels like the rough texture of skin beneath her hands and then she looks back at the mountain and she sees the faces of everybody that she stepped over and destroyed uh, throughout her life and all of the things that she did and then she can't decide if they're reaching for her or if she should be reaching for them and she has this dark moment of did I already do that like I out I made myself like I've made myself unable to reach out to other people and when I did that like I basically built a mountain out of, out of my emotions and blocked myself from other people and it's just it's all imagery it's all figurative language it's all art that tells the story blended with different kinds of literary devices it's it's a it's a 
beautiful piece of literature. Um, we talk about comics all the time as literature and how there's a stigma that comics are not are, are not books or that comics are not real literature. And every once in a while comes the perfect piece to argue more than ever uh, because they're all, all literature. It's all storytelling. It's all a beautiful experience. You can get all the classic elements of storytelling from every single comic that you pick up. But we get these high literary concepts uh, sometimes in comic books that we're not prepared to be blown away by. And this was definitely one of them. Uh, I can't wait to, like, I just, I just kind of want to book club this entire experience because it was so good. And it's, it's one of those, no matter who reads it, you're probably going to get something different out of it because we all have our own vices that we're bringing into the world. And she's kind of a representation of I'm here now and I have to deal with this and I'm here to take the place of the person before me who had to deal with being the ether and being lost to the world and now it's my turn to accept all the things I did wrong and kind of like guide the next person. Such a great comic, such a deep concept uh, and what a great one shot. Um, we didn't need any more. It's so good. It's perfect. Um, I love it. Um, congratulations to this creative team for just making a great thing. And the Eisner Award team, if you're listening, we're always in need of a best single issue of a comic book. I don't know what else to tell you. Like, this has poetry and comic, like, sequential art blended together uh, all in one beautiful package. And it is a single issue. So, you know, if you're on that Eisner board and you're looking for some great nominations... Here's a single issue of a comic book that brings every piece of literature together to tell a great story. Um, just throwing that out there. I'm not on the board. I can't make that decision. So, uh, but if you are, keep that in mind. A Theris from Source Point. Great book. I'm going to take a drink of wine really fast. All right. There's a lot of other books out this week. A lot of them are amazing. We're not going to talk about all of them, but we are going to fly through them. Up first, uh, finally, issue three of the Swamp Thing Green Hill from DC's Black Label. Jeff Lemire, Doug Monkey. So good. Oh my gosh. You need to read it. Um, we are celebrating the Women of Marvel this month with her Women's History Month. This is a great story of She Hulk trying to defend all of the other women of Marvel who are just trying to live their lives and do their jobs and are being put on trial for existing as women. So what a great concept. Um, but it's done in such a funny way. Love it uh, so much. Um, Dune House Harkonnen uh, issue three is out from Boom Studios this week. Milestone is celebrating its 30th anniversary, and this is a one-shot to celebrate that. It is a new Static Shock story, as a uh, Static story, um, as well, and we've got some really cool, like, Static and Batman Beyond, like, team-ups. Like, oh my gosh, look at this. This is amazing. You need this if you are a fan of Static, for sure. You kind of see the original Static and the new Static uh, designs come together in a lot of it. It's great. Red Goblin, a uh, second print of issue one for the new Red Goblin series that's going on is out this week. Wonder Woman issue 797 with this gorgeous International Women's Day variant featuring Wonder Woman, Yada Floor, and Mary Marvel, who is a big part of the current Wonder Woman storyline. So grab that. We've got Wasp issue two out. This goes great with the Ant-Man covers that came out from the Ant-Man series done by the same team recently. Um, so how are you mean? writing Wasp? You should just be reading that. Uh, Tiger Division issue five from Marvel Comics featuring a lot of AAPI heroes who are amazing. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue 138 with that cool Jenica uh, Eastman cover. Look at how dope that is. We've got Superman issue two from the dawn of DC, Joshua Williamson's new run on Superman. I have heard nothing but incredible things, and this does feature the first appearance of new anti-hero, uh, who everybody is freaking out about this week. Star Wars Darth Vader issue 32. Look at this great cover for Ewoks number one coming soon. Oh my gosh. Uh, Spider-Man The Last Hunt. The Lost Hunt, I always say that backwards, uh, issue five out this week. I think this is my last copy. You guys were really like into The Lost Hunt this week. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man issue 22. 
this spawn a scorched issue 16 we are flying through these spawn universe books right now there are so many like every week she hulk issue 11 from rainbow row with these gorgeous and bartel covers always amazing nightwing issue 102 with the teen titans getting the gang back together loving that uh the trade paperback for nightwing volume one of tom taylor's run is finally like coming soon to stores it's only been in hardcover since it released we're finally going to see a trade paperback coming soon uh so let your local comic shop know if you are waiting for that monica rambo photon issue four from marvel comics marauders issue 12 and i believe steve orlando still on it yep steve orlando is still writing those marauders issues uh, Joe Fix It issue three has been a fan favorite, something we usually sell out of because people are just loving the Joe Fix It return. I mean, it's Peter David actually on on Joe Fix It. Harley Quinn Legion of Bats issue six. This is spinning out of your Harley Quinn TV show, the animated show, um, and I just absolutely adore this cover. I love the variant is them as old ladies sitting together like grumpy old men. It's cute. Uh, Flash 795. This is a part of your one minute war. So if you've been following that story arc, this does continue it. They recently put out a uh, the first three issues of that one minute war in a compendium that you could pick up like an oversized issue. But if you're still going with it, those are there. Uh, Doctor Strange is back. Dead no more, I guess. Uh, he has returned. This is issue one of Doctor Strange. I'm completely out of cover A, but there's a lot of really cool ones. This is a Stormbreaker variant. Uh, there is an America Chavez icon cover that came out for Doctor Strange this week. But if you are a Doctor Strange fan, he's back. He's got his own title. Grab it. It's a little bit oversized, too. Catwoman, issue 53 with the Sweeney Boo cover. Um... We are getting so many good variants for Catwoman recently. Like, they are just throwing all kinds of artists at Catwoman. Uh, ever since Jenny Frizen moved to Poison Ivy, we've got, like, three different variants for Catwoman on top of the regular ones, uh, which are done by Nakayama. Uh, Avengers Rage of Ultron, issue one. This is a Marvel Tales that is featuring the uh, whole Rage of Ultron storyline. It's an anthology series shining a spotlight on fan favorite characters, timeless stories, things like that. And this is featuring, like I said, the Ultron, Rage of Ultron graphic novel. Uh, Batman One Bad Day, Ra's al Ghul. Batman's villains have been having some bad days that made them who they are. And this is the Ra's al Ghul story uh, for that. Batman Superman, World's Finest, issue 13. Can the duo defeat Darkseid? You know, we'll find out. Uh, Black Adam, issue nine, still going. If you are loving that series, you need to make sure you're keeping up with it because it is still coming out pretty regularly. Uh, Gun Honey is back with Blood for Blood, issue three. Um, this is one of those books that everybody was surprised by it when it came out and how, like, incredibly cool it was. Check it out if you didn't pick it up. This is the second, I think, volume of Blood of Gun Honey. Uh, Gru Gods Against Gru issue four from Dark Horse out this week. Monstrous issue 44. Somebody just asked me the other day, what, when did Monstrous end? It didn't. It's not done yet. You can still keep going. Uh, you can also, if you've never read Monstrous, start with an image first uh, for only $1 and check out the series and see if it's for you. Undiscovered Country issue 24 from Scott Snyder and Charles Sewell. Um, a team like powerhouse of a, writing a story about the fall of America. Um, Frank Frazetta's Dawn Attack issue three. If you are a Frazetta fan, you need to be collecting this series as well because it is another one of the Frazetta Girl Opus team ups to bring back some Frazetta art into some modern storytelling. Deceased War of the Undead Gods issue seven with this dope Mary Marvel, Mary Shazam. I'm going to never get that right. Uh, Mary Shazam acetate cover. DC's Legion of Bloom issue one. This is the uh, spring celebration issue from DC. All about the Legion of Doom. All becoming kind of plant-based characters. And uh, just the stare chew poison ivy. I know a lot of people have been coming in for it. 
Uh, Carnage is back. Issue 11. Uh, no longer Ram B writing, I think. I think we've moved on to a different creator. Um, ooh, I could double check that, but I think I saw that on the cover A this week. And then uh, GCPD, The Blue Wall, and it is issue 6. And I'm always here for it, even if it's solely just for the Frank Avila art. Like, these covers by Frank Avila have been gorgeous. I'm always in for Frank Avila art, just if, if you didn't know that. Like, I'm 100% happy to have Frank Avila do art on everything. Uh, trade paperbacks out this week. We have the Power Girl Power Trip out. This is... Um, so many people, but it's Jeff Johns, Jimmy Palmiotti, Amanda Connor, and Justin Gray. And it is a uh, collects JSA classified one through four and Power Girl one through 12. So if uh, you picked up Action Comics recently and you were like, I don't know who Power Girl is, uh, I need to go back and check it out. This is a great way to do that because this is a cool Power Girl series in an oversized trade paperback um, that you can check out a bunch of Power Girl story. We've got some cool, oh my god, I don't even know where to start. So I'll start here. Parasomnia Volume 2 is out from uh, Colin Bunn and Andrea Moody from Dark Horse Comics. This is the story of a man whose son has gone missing and the only time he can find him is in the dreams and when he's sleeping. So he has given up everything in his life to sleep all the time to try to find his son. Um, super cool story where we get to see a, a real world and a dream world scenario in every issue. And Andrea Moody's art is just absolutely perfect for that style. If you're a fan of Bunny Mask and you are not reading Parasomnia, you're missing out on some really cool Andrea art. Um, but I just, this story is extensive uh, and wonderful and very Dr. Sleep for people who are fans of that. From Vault Comics, we have Quest Aside. This is the whole thing. This is all of the series wrapped up in one beautiful trade that uses the tagline, It's Always Sunny in the Realms. This is a group of people who work at a bar together in a D&D &D style world, and the king is coming to buy their property, and they're kind of like, damn the man, save the empire, essentially. Uh, but in an Always Sunny in Philadelphia almost kind of way. Uh, so if they if Always Sunny cast played D&D &D and you mixed it together and then had a really, really good writer on it, this is what you would get out of this. So quest aside, grab it. If you didn't read it, this is great. And honestly, if they want to do another volume, we're all here for it. West of Sundown, Volume 1. I told you last week this trade existed. Here it is. So this is Volume 1, Issues 1 through 5, West of Sundown, Tim Seeley, writing the Universal Monsters in the Old West. The Dead Lucky. This is potentially the whole story, possibly just Volume 1. I'm going to assume it's Volume 1. Uh, also connected to your massive verse. Also doesn't need you to read anything else. This is the story of a woman who returns back from war. All of her platoon was dead. She sees the ghosts of them. They help her fight against the injustices in society. Now, check it out. It's fantastic. Um, and lastly, we've got Creep Show Volume 1. Issues 1 through 5 of Creep Show Anthology Series. Every issue had different creators working on different stories. Each issue had two stories. So when you read this, you're going to get 10 stories for the cost of one trade, which is great. And um, it's so good. Skybound, thanks for bringing back, um, I think it was Skybound that brought it back, right? Yeah, Image Skybound. Um, thanks for bringing back Creep Show because it was great. Um, and everybody loved it. You probably can't find single issues, but it's okay because now it's in trade and you can get them and it's wonderful. That's all the books that we have for you that are out this week. There are some really great ones coming out next week and I'm going to pull them up really fast because I didn't, uh, do that really beforehand because I was not, I, I forgot. Um, but we've got a list of them and it's gonna be great. Okay, we've got Dark Knights of Steel is coming back. Issue 10. It's about time. Something is Killing the Children, issue 30. Crazy. We're at 30 issues of Something is Killing the Children. Um, Star Wars High Republic, Unstoppable Doom Patrol, number one is out. I know everybody has been asking about that. 
We've got, boop, boop, I'm gonna skip over the rest of these Power Rangers. Ninja Turtles, uh, volume two, number four is out. Uh, Bloodstained Teeth, Once Upon the Time at the End of the World, number five. The It's Jeff, number one, the reprints of the Marvel Unlimited. Jeff, the Land Shark book is out. Let's just all have a party in honor of that. I'm super stoked. Uh, Philadelphia, issue 29. Sandman Universe, Dead Boy Detectives, issue four. Love Sick, issue six. Lo six. Local Man, issue two. Ambassadors, number one. The Approach, number five. Can't wait to see what Megan Hutchinson did on her one and ten. Uh, Indigo Children, number one. Hellboy in Love, number four. It's only a teenage. Wa it's only teenage wasteland, number four. Uh, Hard Eyes, number five. Talk about a book that's been delayed. Can't wait to see how that wraps up. Um, Dungeons and Dragons, Saturday Morning Adventures, number one. So we had the TMNT uh, adventures coming out recently and the G.I. Joe adventures, which are based on the Saturday morning cartoons. Now we're getting a DD and d one. The Exiled, issue two. Um, Dragon Age, the Missing, issue three. Liquid Kill, issue two. Common Rider, zero, one, number three. Lovecraft Unknown Kadoth number seven, Godfell issue two, Ancient Enemies number three, Dead Seas number four, Don't Spin in the Wind number one, Play, Play Things issue five, uh, Rocket Man and Rocket Girl number one, Bulls of Beacon Hill number three, Granite State Punk issue one should be out this week from Scout. Oh my gosh, uh, we have a uh, do to do, I'm like trying to get down to Vigia number three. And so much more. There are so many books out this week. It's going to be a great week for comic books. I'm super stoked. Things to keep in mind coming up. We have at the end of April, we'll have our next $1 book club. It is $1 to buy the book. If you already have the book, it's free to show up. We are going to talk about Hell Cop issue one uh, from this image first, which I actually believe is volume three of Hell Cop. But we are going to jump into this issue. We're going to read this issue, and then we're not going to read any more Hell Cop. So if Hell Cop's not your jam, doesn't matter. This is the only issue you're going to read. If you haven't read Hell Cop before, you're going to find out all about what's going on in that universe when you come to $1 Book Club at the end of the month. Now's a great time to grab this because you've got about a month to read it, kind of digest it, go back, think about it. So we'll have these up the counter. This is our next book. Next uh, May will be a completely different book. Like I said, check it out. And again, things that are going on. Don't forget, uh, at the end of April and leading into May, you can catch The Ballad of Old Manatee, a new musical that takes place at the historic village that's going to be raising money to keep the historic Manatee Village Church uh, intact, get all the restorations done. This is also a great way to celebrate the Manatee, Old Manatee community, which is including the Bat City building and all of the buildings around us, which we'd love to support. We have Megacon coming up next Friday, March 31st. We are going to be there doing a panel at 2 p.m. in the Family Zone, a comic creation workshop, much like the ones we do here at Bat City. But we are going to be doing it at Megacon. All ages accepted. Come join us. Learn how to tell the story uh, that you want to put into your comic book during that day. It's going to be a lot of fun. The store will be closed March 31st because we'll be here at Megacon. But come join us if you're going to be at Megacon. We definitely want to see you all uh, at the panel or just somewhere around the con because it'll be a lot of fun. Um so many great events coming up at Bad City. Uh, April 1st, which is Saturday, is Young Adult Cafe at noon. Uh, that is for all of you teenagers who love comic books, anime, manga, other nerdy things to come talk to your friends about it. So join us Saturday at noon for Young Adult Cafe. And um, our April calendar will be dropping this week on our Facebook so you can follow along and see what events are coming. We can't wait to have you uh, come hang out with us, whether it's at an event or just a Wednesday in the store, like the one coming up this week, where we'll definitely see you. Until then, have a wonderful night, happy reading, and enjoy. Bye, everyone.